guys, it's Reagan and welcome to the start of another reading vlog. This reading vlog is extra special because folks, in Austin, Texas, we're getting a lot of rain and we've been getting rain all morning. Um, we're gonna have a lot more rain today and we're also gonna have a lot of rain tomorrow. So I decided this would be the perfect opportunity to have a bit of a rainy day readathon moment. I have lots of books picked out. I hope to read lots of pages over the next couple of days and I'm really excited to read and share this rainy experience with all of you. But before we dive into the TBR itself, first a word from this video sponsor, which is Curology. I'm so excited to say I am partnering up with Curology for this video. As we all know, I'm a big skincare fan. My morning and nightly skincare routine is one of my favorite parts of my day, which is why I'm so excited to be talking about and working with Curology for this video. If you're not familiar, Curology is the leader in providing made-for-you prescription-based skincare that you can get online and send directly to your door. The convenience of this is truly unparalleled, if I'm being honest. Obviously, through Curology, you're able to access an array of skincare products designed for your specific skin type, from moisturizers to cleansers, makeup remover, and I also especially love their lip balm. But my favorite part about Curology is that you're able to work directly with a dermatology provider, allowing you to get access to products with active ingredients designed to target things like acne or fine lines and wrinkles with a retinoid based product. And for me personally, I knew I wanted to introduce a retinoid based product into my own skincare routine, but I wanted to work directly with a provider to make sure that the dosage and amount worked best for me. I'm currently using this a few nights a week in my nighttime routine paired with a moisturizer and I already feel like my skin is bouncier than ever, which I personally love and what I was looking for. I also love that I can continue to work directly with my provider and they can update my dosage as need be based on my skin needs, which I also love. Truly the convenience and access to specialized products of Curology is unmatched. Everything is sent directly to my door. So I never have to worry about running out of my products or needing to run to the store to pick something up. And the fact that I'm able to access specialized skincare needs online and work directly with a provider at my home and my own convenience, I love too. I have of course have a very special offer if you guys use my link down in my description you guys are able to get 50% off your first box which includes your custom formula based on your skin needs as well as six free skin essentials which is perfect to carry you through this winter season again a big shout out to Curology for sponsoring this video but without further ado let's go ahead and dive back into the vlog but without further ado let's go ahead and talk about the books I want to read Two of them are very seasonally appropriate and are definitely my main focus and priority. The first is Starling House by Alex E. Haro. This is like a gothic horror mystery story about a small town and a creepy house and our main character who begins working there. Um, I've heard great things about this author's writing style and I just love anything gothic and I'm trying to squeeze in as many of these books as possible before the end of the fall season. In that same vein, it's been a minute since I've read a witchy book and this is like a Gilmore Girls sort of small town witchy story that's about like second chance and romance but also heartbreak and family. I've heard good things about it. I hear it's really really charming. It's also not too long so I feel like it could be a rather fast read. So these are my these are my main priorities over the next uh, 48 hours in the next 48 rainy hours, but I also want to try to get very far in Wraith by John Gwen. I have about 300 pages left of this book. So ideally I would love to be finished with it. Um, I flew through the first three books of the series and for some reason I've accidentally left the last one to just kind of linger on in the background. I'm liking it. I don't think I'm liking it as much as the other books and I can talk more about that in this vlog but I do want to at least read a bit more of a chunk of this so I can finish it up before the end of the month. This is my plan and I'm excited about all of the books. But a new bout of heavy rain has just started. Our poor gutters cannot keep up even though they are clear I promise but it's raining so hard our backyard is actually kind of flooded a little bit but we haven't gotten this this been like months and months and months and months and months since we've had a heavy rain so everyone locally is pretty excited about it especially the trees it also feels appropriate to light a couple of candles to enjoy this cozy rainy weather please ignore how messy my desk is but i'm actually about to sit down and record a podcast with monica we're doing a gilmore girls episode today which feels apt given pouring rain outside. Anyone was wondering, it's still raining hours later, which we're enjoying. But now it's time to make lunch. We've uh, obviously are only using the coziest lighting to embrace the kind of darkness outside due to the rain. We have some falafel in the oven and I'm just gonna whip together a quick salad. Quick salad time. So we have some lettuce, 
some olives. Must needed, much needed. And then I made this yogurt sauce the other, like a couple days ago, which will be very good on top. And then for additional toppings, I'm gonna chop up a cucumber and some red onion, and I think we'll be all set. Lunch is served. Bon appetit. Alrighty, it's time for an afternoon cup of coffee and I'm also gonna get myself a little sweet treat because it's that time of year. That time of year that is where I have a giant bucket of Halloween candy at my disposal at all costs or at all times. So obviously I have to take advantage before I give it all out to the children. <laughs> Other exciting news, I'm also going to sit down now and start Starling House by Alexi e. Harrow, which I'm so excited about. So, wish me luck. Hi guys, I'm here with a reading update because I've actually read 75 pages of Starling House and I must say, I'm really liking this book. This book is darker and moodier than I was anticipating. And I don't just mean like in an atmospheric sense, but even like the contents of this book are rather, dark and i would also say so far i'm incredibly impressed by the writing style it has this like it's beautifully written yes there's also things like footnotes and stuff uh intermixed throughout the narrative story which provide the sort of interjection style that i think is working just so well but to take a step back what is this book about so this is a multi-pov story but primarily it's told from the perspective of our main character opal and opal has lived in this really small town this kind of like no nothing town her entire life and she has one goal and one goal only and that is to get her younger brother out of this town she is 26 at the start of this novel she is the sole guardian of her younger brother who is a junior or so in high school she works numerous jobs around town she steals she lies she cheats all with the goal of having enough money to send her brother to a prestigious school and then ultimately on to a college where he will be able to kind of start out on a new life. And one day, due to a variety of unlikely circumstances, she gets an opportunity to start working at like the only thing that this town has that's like a name to fame, and that is this place called the Starling House. And the Starling House is this sort of fairy tale, dark tale of woe that exists within the town. It was once owned by a very wealthy family who are like a power coal family. So they kind of, you know, took a lot from the land and uh, are now incredibly wealthy. But one of the brothers married this woman named um, Starling. This woman passed away in like the 1800s, but she wrote a book that after the fact became very, very famous and is our main character's like favorite book from childhood. And this house has existed in this town ever since. No one goes there, no one stops by. There's always a Starling house guardian, custodian, if you will. And at the beginning of this book, for a variety of reasons, Opal kind of gets pulled in by this house. She's also haunted by dreams of this house and she begins working there because it pays very well. Um, and the person who works there is our other perspective that we do read from and his name is Arthur. He has a very mysterious past. He has a very mysterious uh, goals, let's say. And he is very lonely and also lives in a very like dark place within this home. And there's just something very clearly screwed up about this house. It's like haunted, but it's beyond haunted. There seems to be some sort of curse in this house, in this town, in this land that has been happening ever since the original Starling died in the 1800s. And as our main character begins to work there, she slowly becomes fascinated with the mystery of this house and begins to try to unlock this mystery. But I really wanna emphasize that this book is dark. It's not like a romanticized, version of this small town of this gothic horror sort of setting and book of this mystery it is much sharper much more brutal much more cutting um not only in what you're discovering when you're looking at the underbelly of this family of this house and of this mystery um but also just like how our characters move through the world both arthur and opal are kind of like tragic cast-offs of the people before them they are working and toiling as hard as they possibly can but for what to just exist within this world they're kind of outcasts they're kind of 
pushed to the side, to the margins of not only this community, but to society. And they're loved by either no one in Arthur's case or by very few in Opal's case. And I'll be interested to see if and what type of relationship could possibly form between these two characters um, as they're now working kind of alongside each other. But there's clearly just so much mystery and the mystery of this house is so much embedded into the history of this town and like the greed and the horror of the past, which is again, continuing to impact present day. I'm really liking the writing style. It's told in a very like linear narrative fashion. Like our main character is experiencing all these things, but it's kind of like, it drifts kind of and I feel pulled along by not only Opal's like train of thought but also as she recounts her own life and again this is where the footnotes come in and I find them to be used in a very interesting way because she is like telling us the story and like referencing the past referencing the present but her memory or how she wants to tell us the story might not always be 100% truthful which is where these footnotes come in they'll either clarify and correct her as a narrator or provide us more background of an event that happened previously within this town we are predominantly existing within our main character's point of view but sometimes we get stories or transcripts from other people as the mystery begins to be filled in and I'm just very mesmerized by how this book is told it's dark though. I really want to emphasize that. Like this is a very sharp story and I'm liking it a lot. Um, but this is by no means like a romanticized version of these tropes that I feel like we often run into in a more romanticized way. It is a very dark and chilling story, but I'm really intrigued by it and I'm curious to see how it's going to unfold. Um, but I read 75 pages quickly and I'm really impressed with it so far. So I'll keep you guys posted, but definitely starting this sort of rainy readathon out strong, though I will say the sun is temporarily out, I think, right now, which is kind of nice because Clay and I are going to get dinner tonight. So we won't have to go out in the rain, but I think the rain is supposed to start up again this evening, which, let me see. We need like 20 feet of water to get out of the drought we're currently in. But, you know, we'll take the five inches. Anyway, I'm going to do a bit more reading now and then get ready for dinner. Hello everyone. We're about to head out to dinner. So I thought I'd do a quick uh, OTD. This is what I'm wearing. And this, this is, is what I'm wearing. Good job, Clay. Anyway, we're about to go feast. Come home and watch probably vampire related television. I think this is crooked. Apologies. Yum. Post dinner dessert. Yum. And now it's time to go in bed, finish my milkshake, and read. Good morning, Matilda. I think it might be a little humid outside. The fog, the condensation on the windows are bananas. Hello, everyone. I have been reading, though transparently, I've been a little slow on my reading both last night and this morning because I got very distracted by Taylor Swift's 1989 release, which... I forgot to anticipate when starting this vlog. So it might be, I might extend this vlog because I want to finish all of these books for you guys. But uh, you know, we had a little curveball. That being said though, I am really liking Starling House. I feel like so far this might be one of my favorites of the gothic atmospheric fall reads that I've picked up this like fall season. I feel like it's hitting not only in the mystery and the atmosphere, but I feel like there's some really complex things happening with the characters and the plot line and the story. It just has this like deepness to it that I'm really appreciating and a mystery that I'm not quite sure what is going on. I'm really compelled by our main character Opal. She is a product of her situation. She is a woman who just to stay safe, has to lash out to protect herself and to protect her brother. She's had to do numerous things to, you know, stay afloat. And you kind of see her survival instinct kind of on display all the time. And you can say the same with Arthur. And our other main character that's been living in this house, we don't really know totally what's going on with this house, but we know um, that he is the warden of it. And the house very much seems alive. And there's some type of legacy associated with it, a legacy of violence and like early death. Um, I really like their slow build of them getting to know each other, like the warming up of these two characters, especially because they're both just like so um, used to just like shutting anyone and everyone out of their lives. They're not really someone who goes out of their way to make connections. So seeing two people just like that, like slowly warm up to each other is very interesting and 
Again, the mystery of this house isn't just for Opal to figure out. There's like other people sniffing around the property that are curious about it as well. And that's part of the story. But I'm just like really into the writing style. I'm really into how everything is unfolding. I just feel like the stylization of this, the setting, um, just how the author sort of portraying the story is just like really compelling to me right now. And I'm just really loving the writing like a lot. So I'm going to keep reading. I'm going to finish this hopefully this morning. I will say there are more words per page than I was expecting. So it might look like a short book page number, but word count wise, it's of a longer book. Let the record show, but I'm going to sit down now, have a bit of a reading session with my cup of coffee, and we're going to do more reading and not get distracted by listening to the vault tracks of 1989. So. up and at him and dress. And I'm happy to report I am in the home stretch of the Starling House and I'm really liking this book. I feel like a lot of the inputs are just working for me. It's not the longest book in the world, but I feel like what the author has decided to focus on is working quite well. Um, I've obviously mentioned our main character Opal quite a bit. I really like her and I think she roots the story well in her moxie. Um, but a large part of this book is mystery. It's a mystery of the house. It's the legacy of this house. It's what happened in the past as it relates to this rich and powerful family which controls not only the wealth but the resources and has kind of been poisoning the town ever since both with their like energy and with their um, malpractice and corporate greed. Um, but we're also learning about Opal herself. She's unpacking the mystery of her mother, her mother's death. And I also really appreciate the complex nature of the relationship between her and her brother. She obviously had to grow up very quickly. She became the guardian of her younger brother, but they are siblings and they're more of a team, but at the same time, she is making unilateral decisions for her brother. And that's going to create conflict between the two of them understandably and i feel like a part of this book is the shifting of their relationship as well as like people in opal's life telling her to you know take something for herself and that she is also worthy of like love or dreams or a second chance or to leave this dang town once and for all which just seems to be ruining her life um, over and over again. The relationship between her and Arthur, I also think is super interesting. Very much gives like classic Gothic vibes, not just in the melodrama, but even in like the way that they're described at the, as these like unbeautiful kind of broken people, but you love them and you, you, it's interesting to see how things develop there. The town mystery, just the corruption and the frustration of the plot lines of what's going on in this book, because there's magical problems, but also real life problems of just people with a lot of money and a lot of power being corrupt. And those things intersecting just creates a lot of tension. Um, I'm flying through the end of this book. And honestly, I can say I don't know how it's going to end, which is fantastic. And the other thing I'll mention is that Matilda's being really cute right now. So let me show you what she looks like. Matilda and Gus the ghost are BFFs. Look at her. Lunch today is a little side salad and some delicious soup. So we're gonna go enjoy, watch some Vanderpump, and then get back to reading and back to work. It's raining again. Love to see it. Also taking a quick survivor break and enjoying the rain. It's so cozy. We're going for a little evening stroll. Not a cloud in the sky at the moment, but they'll be reforming soon. So we thought we would take this as an opportunity to get some fresh air. So here we are. Incredibly gloomy day and gloomy morning under our belts, which I am looking forward to. You know, three gloomy days in a row, not bad. I am in the midst of brewing some coffee. And uh, I owe you all a reading update about my book too which I did start. But for now, I'm gonna read some of Wraith, which I'm going to enjoy this morning before I completely pivot um, in the reading update, which we will talk more about 
in a bit, but first we gotta make this coffee. Clay did make these Halloween cupcakes last night, and I think I'm gonna have one for breakfast because it is the season, you know? The caffeine hit, so I'm ready to do a reading update. It's also super cold in my house because we had a cold front, and which is great, but our heater is broken, so it's definitely snuggle up in sweater, lots of blankets in the house today. I feel like I have a lot to talk about, so let's just do a bit of an update. So I finished Darling House yesterday and I really enjoyed this book. I feel like I've been saying really positive things about this book the entire time, but it like continues to persist. I really enjoyed the writing style. I liked the concept. I liked the small town setting. I liked the character arcs and growth. I also found the characterization to be a sharper one, which I appreciated, but I appreciated also that there could still be moments of softness in the sharpness. I just really enjoyed this interpretation of a gothic tale and story, particularly with the haunted house. I also appreciated including the legacy of like a small Southern town and the family impact of that too. And like generational trauma and stuff like that, like within this story, I just feel like it worked well. And then the celebration of like second chances and seizing a life for yourself and escaping that sort of cycle was really good to read. I really liked this book quite a bit and I'll definitely be reading other books by Alex e. Haro because I also just enjoyed the writing style and even the structure of the book. Um, the story also has illustrations throughout it, which I'm not sure if I mentioned, um, which work really well because often this book references this like creepy children's book that was written in this house, which is our main character's favorite book. And that book also had creepy illustrations. So it just like the parallel of that was very effective. So I've read this 300 pages, amazing, 10 out of 10. Wow, such a success. From there, I was like, let's keep this momentum going. And I picked up the second book of this vlog, which is The Unfortunate Side Effects of Heartbreak and Magic. I read like 50 pages of this, I'm not gonna lie. And I was just not feeling it. And then I started reading Goodreads reviews. I missed the boat, I guess, on other people not really enjoying this book. Um, but if you look at Goodreads, the reviews are kind of all over the place. And I wanted like a cozy, lighthearted, fun, small town read. And this just really wasn't entertaining me in that way. So I've read 50 pages. I don't even really want to talk too in depth about it because I haven't read enough to like form like a full opinion, but I've read enough to know that it just wasn't for me and it's just not my vibe at the moment. So I've decided to DNF this and move on because I wanna keep my reading momentum good because I'm still hoping to read three books for this vlog. So last night and this morning, because I didn't quite know what I wanted to read to replace that, I picked up my third book of this vlog, which is Wraith by John Gwen. At the beginning of this video, I had 300 pages remaining of Wraith, which is the fourth and final book to the Faithful and the Fallen series. I marathoned obviously the first three books of the series and documented the process, started the fourth book and have just been kind of slowly reading it to wrap up the month. Um, between last night and this morning, I've read 150 pages of this final installment, meaning I've read 450 pages for this vlog. Um, I have some thoughts about this last book and my thoughts generally are, I'm just not liking it as much as the first three books. Like the first three books were like five out of five stars. This feels more like almost a three star read for me. It's not bad. I think just the parts that I loved about the three first books just aren't as present. And the stuff that I maybe ignored and didn't love as much just feel really pronounced and even worse within this final book. But let me sit down and we'll talk about this more because I feel like I need to do a full reading update and not just stand here. So I'm gonna go read more of this, but we need to do a reading update. But first, we have to appreciate how snuggled Matilda is this morning. She's just trying to stay warm and cozy. So obviously The Faithful and the Fallen has been consuming my life quite a bit over the past six weeks or so. And this series is a multi POV fantasy series by John Gwen. It's very, very epic. There's lots of characters. It utilizes a lot of well-known fantasy tropes. And I would say over the course of all of the novels, it's very combat forward and basically a good versus evil sort of fight to save the world. And the first book you're introduced to all the characters, it's very slow moving, it's very classic. It's a little cheesy, but in more in an endearing way. And in books two and three, you begin to see the beginnings and the middle of this conflict. There are a huge variety of different skirmishes and just like political alliances and plot twists and all of these unlikely character crossings and interactions and it's just so plot forward it becomes addicting to read and impossible to put down obviously in the fourth and final book we are in the 
final arc, the conclusion of this series. And I have about 150 pages of this book left. And I enjoyed the first 50% of this book because I feel like for the most part, it was within the same style of the first three books I read. I think what I'm struggling with this fourth and final installment is, is that the plot feels a little expected to me but I feel like what I was so obsessed with in the first three books was I truly did not know where the book was going versus I can kind of see where the pieces are falling into place and it feels a little um expected to me and I think that coupled with another phenomenon that is I feel like the cheesiness factor which has always been there but for me was there in like an endearing way is like really amped up to like another level i'm just feeling like the characters which felt really interesting and dynamic feel almost like caricatures in this final book like everyone is just too perfect or like too evil in a way that just makes me not feel as endeared to them for some reason like i don't feel as connected to the characters in this fourth installment as i did in the first three books at all which makes some highly emotional moments like just not land as intensely for me i don't know if this is like my problem but i'm just struggling with like the tone and execution of this book quite a bit again this book has always been like fight for courage and like you know like very classic um good versus evil characters who are like so perfect it's hard to find anything wrong with them but there was like other things at play um like emotional journeys that you could feel connected with and i just feel like in this final installment it just feels like a little too much for me which has made it hard to feel as propelled to like read this book quickly as i did with the first three books which is why i think it's taking me almost all month to read this book versus i read the first three books in the span of like a week essentially um it's not bad I just feel like it's just not landing as successfully as I had with the first three installments. I do have 150 pages left, so like who knows, things could change. I'm curious to see how everything's going to wrap up with this final battle and fight, which is definitely gearing to be the case, but I'm just struggling. In other news though, it's time for my breakfast of champions. My cupcake, my morning cupcake very well deserved you know hi friends so great news i have oh live footage of matilda stealing my seat complete but i feel like i've been striking out a bit for the books i have you know recently featured obviously i loved the starling house didn't love my cozy pickup I had planned and Wraith, obviously I'm liking, but not loving, but I have decided on my cozy book replacement, which I'm gonna sit down now and start. And I'm so excited about it. Actually a book I picked up recently, I grabbed it after filming a video as this book's actually super popular. I just hadn't read it. And the book is um, Keeper of Enchanted Rooms by Charlie N. Holmber. And this just sounds really, really delightful. It's basically set in the mid 1800s. We follow two main characters. The first is Barrett. And he comes from a complicated home life and at the beginning of this book he inherits unexpectedly a house from his recently passed away grandmother but when he gets to the house he realizes that the house is haunted i believe there's magic in this world and i think the legacy of magic is also complicated but one of the things that can result is houses can be imbued with power and they can persist in that power because like enchanted physical objects like keep their power through time. But he has a haunted magical house and this house and him are not getting along. Enter in our other main character and she works for the Boston Institute of Enchanted Rooms and she's dedicated her whole life to magic and these enchanted properties and homes and she is dedicated to preserving them. Um, so she is up to the task, she's up to the challenge to try to figure out what is going on with this house and I believe they begin working together. I just feel like this is going to be an interesting mix of like cozy and endearing and enchanting. I think it's gonna be a lot about finding your own home, a place to settle in. And I'm really excited to learn about how the magic in this book works. Again, I've heard really excellent things about this book, so I'm gonna sit down now and start it. I want something that'll just like bring a smile to my face, and I feel like this could be that. It is time for lunch, and we got bagels yesterday, so I thought, you know, let's eat the bagels today too. I have, ooh, I have a cheddar jalapeno one, which I have not eaten. I also have an everything bagel. It's a hard, hard choice, hard choice. I feel like I'm gonna be wearing this sweater every single day this week, if I'm being honest. I got this a few years ago, but I feel like I 
took a break from it for a minute and now I'm like re-obsessed with it, which is always fun with your own closet, you know? Um, but anyway, I'm about to sit down and do some reading before I get up and cook dinner. But I've already done some reading, so I wanted to give you guys my initial thoughts and feelings of Keeper of Enchanted Rooms, which are very positive. This is definitely feeling like a cozy, endearing, um, slightly spooky read that I was looking for. So first and foremost, we kind of have two different timelines going on, which I'm liking. So we've been introduced to one of our main characters, Merritt, who is a writer. He has a bit of a vague background. You get the sense very quickly that he has a very complicated relationship with his family, um, which is why he was very surprised when he inherited a house after his grandmother's passing. He travels there. He's looking forward to establishing himself, having a home for himself, um, just looking forward to the future. Unfortunately, the house is enchanted and doesn't like him very much. So again, that's why our other main character, Holda, goes out there. And uh, so far, it's really about us getting acclimated with the world and the magic of this house and our two characters sort of getting to know each other. First and foremost, I'm so fascinated by the magic of this house. There's different schools of magic. I wouldn't say like the world building or the magic system is like hyper complex. Like this is trying to be like cozy and straightforward, but it is interesting enough where there's like different schools of thought and like different things going on that I'm rather intrigued about the whole thing works. Like there's different types of enchanted houses, like different spells can be put on different establishments and spells can also persist on a property because it can't die which i also think is interesting and this house in particular has a very strong sets of spells on it which makes it a tricky case and it also makes the house feel very much alive and not necessarily haunted in like a scary way but more so like it has a personality and it's kind of like acting out um, and I'm not very far, but you can already get the sense of like this very clear found family scenario. Like the house is literally going to be a part of this found family scenario. Like the house is a main character in this book and I'm liking it. Um, Merritt, I like, he seems very affable, very, very likable, um, clearly frustrated with the house and he's not quite sure what to do. And Holda, our main character, I'm also really enjoying her. She's very like buttoned up by the book. She's very passionate about magic. She's very passionate about these enchanted homes and protecting them. Um, and she is determined to crack any type of case. And we kind of get a hint that she's had a very difficult case in the past. And that seems to be kind of perhaps a mystery or part of this book. Like there's a couple different like subtle mysteries sort of going on alongside this narrative. We have a friend visiting already in this house and they're getting to know each other. But alongside this sort of I wouldn't call it present day because it's happening in like the 1840s. We do flash back to kind of uh, the earlier part of the 1800s because we have this character in London who's going on this quest to achieve and obtain as much power as possible, which is actually quite dark. Like we have these very lighthearted chapters switching between Holda and Merritt as they go about this house, which is obviously difficult and stressful, but for the most part, like a fun time. And then we have these really dark, sinister chapters of this man in his endless fight for power. You know what I mean? But yeah, I have about 100 pages of this book read so far. I'm going to read more now. I'm going to read more tonight. My goal is to finish this book for this vlog. And I also have 150 pages left of Wrath, which I also want to finish. Um, I'm near the end of the month so I gotta wrap up all these books ahead of my wrap up um, but yeah I feel like I'm gonna fly through this book it's very endearing and very cozy but I wouldn't say it's like by definition cozy because there are triggers within this book I do want to call that out and keep that in mind but yeah I am enjoying this I love a house mystery you know what I mean great news I read another 50 pages and now I've been working on dinner we're making some mashed potatoes and some roasted broccoli but the piece de piece de resistance I think I said that right, probably not. Is this whole chicken I have been roasting. I just took the lid off because now it's gonna get all nice and golden brown. 30 minutes, we're gonna be chowing down. Whole chickens feel very complicated, but really, they're actually not. And then you have a bunch of chicken for the week. Dinner is served. I'm so proud of how I cut up this chicken, I'm not gonna lie. This looks so good. Now it's time for some what we do in the shadows. But now it's officially time, hello Christmas pajamas, <laughs> to uh, read more of my book. I wanna get to almost completing this and if I don't finish it tonight, I'll finish it in the morning. I'll be sure to update y'all once again, but this book is so cute so far. Hello, good morning. It's the morning. Cheers. 
Um, I keep accidentally extending this vlog. I'm definitely going to be ending it this morning because I'm going to be finishing Keeper of Enchanted Rooms this morning. Um, I was able to read a chunk of it last night and I'm really enjoying this book. This story is still very much about this house, our two main characters, Merritt and Holda, learning about them and their past. And it's also about understanding the house's mystery, like why it's enchanted, like the origin of that, and also people moving into the house to start working there. So it's very much about like establishing this place, very found family-esque if you get the picture. It has a lot of humor. Um, it's kind of lighthearted, but what, what I will say, but alongside this like wholesome house storyline, there is a sort of spooky storyline that stems from our character's past um, that I'm a little surprised by, but I'm liking. It adds a little bit of urgency, adds a little bit of intensity, and I'm really curious about it. And a lot of this spooky and a lot of the tension in this book has to do with like secrets and people kind of holding on to their past or like the past coming to knock once again if they like it or not. I'm also still really enjoying learning about the magic in this world. It's straightforward, but I also feel like it has some layers to it. A large part of the magic is that it's like tied to genealogy namely magic had its origin and every subsequent generation um, magic has gotten a little less strong and how magic sort of works is like you have a type of magic that you're a part of and you can either have like one spell and be like really strong at that one spell or have many spells and all of those uh, spells are a little bit weaker you can either be like a jack of all trades or an expert and it's all just sort of random so our characters learning about their families and their past is kind of part of this book too. But I'm just very endeared by the relationships, the writing style. It's like not a book that's blowing my mind, but it's very endearing as I read along and I'm like curious to see how the whole thing is going to progress. It's a quick read. It's an entertaining read. And I'm just, I'm loving to learn about this Wimbrel house. You know, I want to live at Wimbrel house. I want to visit it. It has an atrium. I'm intrigued, you know? So anyway, I'm gonna continue to work to finish this this morning. It should not be a problem. I'm also enjoying the pacing of the relationship between our two main characters, Holda and Merritt. Holda in particular is like, she's been hurt in the past, so she has her guard up quite a lot. And seeing Merritt like slowly uh, break through that guard and they become a little bit closer, I'm also really enjoying too, but anywho. I am gonna get back to reading now. Hi guys, and welcome to the end of the vlog. Later in the day, the sun is officially out. That means my rainy day reading vlog has to end, simply said. That being said though, I'm happy to report that first and foremost, I did read Keeper of Enchanted Rooms. I completed this novel and I really liked it. If you're looking for like an endearing, cozy story with a little bit of stakes and a little bit of a plot line, but ultimately is one that is more about like characters, finding a second chance, love, friendship, um, a quirky home with a personality, and honestly a very charming set of rooms about it. Like this is the book for you. I feel like it balances being incredibly approachable while still having like engaging fantasy elements that really kept me intrigued. A little bit of a thrillery plot line, but again ultimately the stakes are pretty low in this, so I felt entertained but not stressed out, which was exactly what I was looking for. And I can see why this book is very popular, but I did read all of this. I also read the entirety of Starling House by Alex E. Haro. This is my first Alex E. Haro book. And I really, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the author's writing style. I enjoyed the characterization, the setting, the influences, the sharpness of the story. I felt like it was a really fresh and interesting take of a set of tropes that quite frankly, I read very, very often. I don't get tired of them, but this was still like, more refreshing than I thought. It's more of like a southern gothic tale, which I thought was fantastic. I've talked about this book quite a bit in this vlog, but just everything about it really called out to me. I highly recommend picking this up for the fall season or honestly anytime. It's not that long. It has everything you want. Interesting family dynamics, romance, small town setting, creepy house and vibes. I liked it a lot. And then lastly, I did read 150 pages of Wrath by John Gwen. This is the fourth and final book to the Faithful and the Fallen series, a series I have read and talked about a lot on my channel. I have about 150 pages left of this. I will be finishing this before the end of the month. I unfortunately have not been loving this as much as the rest of the series, but I'm sure I will go more in depth about that in my wrap up if you want 
more thoughts there. But yeah, over 800 pages read, not bad. I am pleased with that for a rainy readathon, you know, impromptu readathon. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video and big shout out again to this video sponsor, which is Curology. I will leave that special 50% offer down below. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I will see you soon with another one soon. Goodbye.